everybody. It is me. It's Steve Simonson. And uh, I'm just jumping on here live because I've been listening to a ton of talk and hand-wringing about tariffs. And I want to give you just a little preview. So uh, first of all, if you're joining on the Facebook Live, welcome to you. Uh, this is episode number 148. Uh, hey, John, how you doing? Uh, so if you go to awesomers.com slash 148, we'll put up any links or show notes and so forth. Uh, so much nice to see you. Um, so we're going to both do this on the Facebook Live, and we're also going to talk about tariffs, and I'll, I'll record this for the awesomers who want to play it back later. So uh, first of all, thanks for the, the uh, folks joining live. Uh, I've been hearing a ton of what I call misinformation about tariffs, and it's 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 to me it's maddening because I don't mind pe people being confused about tariffs. That's not an unreasonable thing, uh, but it's concerning to me when there um, are various bits of information that are not being passed along to uh, sellers or, or interested parties, or or worse, that it's being passed on in incorrectly. So. Uh, that that's a big concern of mine, and I think everybody's concerned about tariffs, or at least many of the sellers who, who do business with China are concerned about tariffs. Uh, and so I want to try to clear up some of the misinformation. So if you're watching live and you feel like you want to ask a question, go ahead and try to ask your question, and I'll try to figure out how to scroll through here and and uh, and answer it. Can you guys hear me okay? Because uh, I I can see some people watching. Uh, just give me a thumbs up or a little heart or whatever. Tell me if you can hear me uh, so I make sure that I'm not wasting my time talking about tariffs. This is going to be just kind of a quick preview, and we'll do something more in depth on Monday. Uh, okay, so I hear uh, Roger says yes, and I got to see a little uh, thumbs up there. So it sounds like uh, people may be hearing, and uh, thank you guys for that validation. Um, all right, so the, the, the point I'm trying to get to is we're, as sellers, we... I think it's not in our interest. Uh, hi, Dana. Thanks for that. Uh, I think it's not in our interest to panic about this stuff. And I've done several episodes about this on the Osmers podcast so far. Again, this one will be Osmers.com slash 148. But don't panic. That's step number one. And also, don't bother getting yourself worked up into a lather about politics and what the future is and how the world's coming to an end. Uh, honestly, I've listened to some podcasts from people that I respect and that I like. And I've just seen so much kind of hand wringing and panic, and I just it is absolutely the opposite of productive. Um, hey, uh, Dana, nice to see you online. Henson, good to see you. Uh, don't correct your screens. I am sunburned. Uh, yesterday, Seattle had sun, and I went out for a, a nice uh, bike ride and walk, and uh, got sunburned. So, in case you're wondering, that's what happened there. So, uh, back on tariffs, just at the top level. First of all, don't get caught up in the idea of who's paying tariffs and who's not paying tariffs. Tariffs are very simple to understand. Um, currently, the tariffs that are being discussed are the ones that, that are being imposed on China for imports into the United States. But make no mistake, tariffs exist all around the world, and any country can impose tariffs on any product that they want to, essentially. There are WTO and other obligations that people have signed up with. The WTO is a World Trade Organization, and people are uh, in some argument that the United States is in violation of the WTO by putting these tariffs on. But that doesn't matter because you and I can't control that and we're not a part of that process. So it doesn't behoove us to get caught up in the politics. It only serves us to understand what do tariffs mean, when do they get paid, and then what do we do about it. And that's, to me, the most important things. And again, I don't – if you guys are asking questions – I can't see them as they go by, uh, but feel free to, if you have a question, ask them here. And this is just meant to be a, just a quick preview. Uh, and again, if you can hear me, just give me the little pluses or the, uh, the little hearts, whatever you got, just so I know that everything's working. My point about tariffs is, number one, the importer of record pays them on the way into the country. Uh, thanks again for the uh, validation there. Uh, so... When you import something, if the tariff applies to that particular product, you will pay that when it clears customs on its way to the United States. And again, this is the scenario of coming from China into the United States, which is obviously the biggest trade channel that exists. And so the importer record is going to pay that. And um, when that is paid, 
that money then goes, in this case, to the U.S. government, which passes it out in whatever way they wish to. Um, in some cases, they're giving farmer subsidies for the counter tar tariffs that China's applying. But it doesn't matter where they, it goes because you and I don't get a cut of that money. So the next kind of question is, what do the tariffs apply to? So we know who's paying, but the import of records paying. But that doesn't mean that that's the only economic variable to be considered. Uh, later, I may get into the idea of how is this affected currency? How do you talk your suppliers into taking some or all of the hit? Um, you know, how do you negotiate other things like terms and insurance and so forth with suppliers when you have a little bit of leverage? Uh, as a buyer, you have leverage right now as long as you have some volume. And so all of these are factors that you, I really want you to consider. And for those who just joined, you know, I started with this premise of don't panic. That's point number one with tariffs. Uh, it doesn't help you to panic. You don't make better decisions. And you can't control this, and I can't control this, by the way, either. Uh, so we just have to react. So without going into the overarching politics of it um, and, and how this problem has been built up for decades, and that this is a significant problem in terms of not just day-to-day -day trade, but intellectual property and you know global freedom, uh, human rights. You know, If you look at the uh, Hong Kong, uh, protests that are happening, that could be a variable used later to that comes into the equation that says, no, we're not going to get rid of the tariffs because you have terrible human rights in China. There's so many variables. So I, I'm just telling you, don't panic. So we, I've already talked about step one. Who pays the tariffs? Import of record pays the tariffs when it clears customs. Step two, what does it apply to? I think if you go to awesomers.com, there is a page on tariffs there. And frankly, I'll, I'll put it in the, the, the show notes, but I don't even remember the, the name of the link. Uh, let's see if I can find it. If you just search, go to Google and search for Awesomers uh, China Tariff List, you'll find it. And we've got a list of the tariff, I think it's the 310, uh, Section 310 items, which is $250 billion of purchases or imports into America that have tariffs applied to them right now. There's a separate list of another $50 billion of products that are mostly industrial types of things. Um, and that leaves about 300 billion that do not yet have tariffs. So I've had several people that are like, oh, my product doesn't have tariffs. It doesn't apply to me. I don't care. And I am telling you, you should care because the next shoe to drop is that that next 300 billion will have 25% applied. And anybody who thinks 25% is the end of the road is making a mistake. Um, I can give you an example. Uh, bamboo bedroom sets in China, China was accused of dumping those and selling them below cost. The uh, something called an anti-dumping duty was applied to that for 400%. So anybody who thinks that like 25% is the end of the road, uh, I think you may not know the, uh, the full thing. <laughs> yes, Carlos, right? Uh, nuclear reactors uh, now have a 25% tariff. Uh, so you should find out what applies to the tariffs, what, which of your products apply to tariffs. You, you probably already know that. Uh, everybody knows that the Section 310, I think it's called, just went from 10% to 25%. Um, and again, I'm just letting everybody know that's not going to be the end of it if this doesn't get resolved. I thought it would be resolved by now. I was clearly wrong. And uh, my hope is that it's resolved in the future. So my next suggestions may not even be useful to you long term. But here's what we see happening. If you have significant volume with a vendor, we see them proactively coming to us. Uh, and when they come to us, they're like, hey, you know, we'll split some of this tariff increase with you. Um, we'll give you, you know, a rebate or we're getting some money back from the local government who's getting it back from the federal government. This is China-based governments. So in some cases, we've had them absorb some or all of the tariff increase. And they also weigh in the currency changes. For any of you guys keeping score, the renminbi, RMB, or CNY, Chinese Yuan, same currency, different names, it's been slipping against the dollar. And this means we have more buying power and some of that difference is made up. And so if you're not tracking that currency and tracking those changes, you're overpaying anyway to begin with. So in some cases, if you have high volume, you can get your vendor to share some of the costs with you. The currency may also make up some of the cost. And, but you should also start thinking about what's the future. What if they 
um, pass a you know 200 percent or 300 percent um, and yeah Kimberly's dealing with bamboo right now uh, I've dealt with wood and bamboo and all kinds of different things over the time uh, one suggestion Kimberly um, if you're doing wood I don't know if it's veneer based products you know where the wood coats the product but if you use US based veneers you can um, you can get around some of those tariffs because they don't have um, in some cases, on some thicknesses, they don't have inbound duties or countervailing tariffs. But uh, again, right now, it's all uh, it's all what it is. So Carlo points out that it's a, a level playing field. I think Roger mentioned that, hey, you can buy British goods without tariffs. One thing I, I want to point out, because I have a lot of my European friends, and they're like, ah, we don't have this problem in Canada. We don't have this problem in the UK or the EU. I can tell you very clearly that Anybody who thinks this is a, a one front war or Trump is somehow a crazy person, which that is a separate issue. <laughs> he may in fact be a crazy person, but that, that this is not a war worth fighting, I think you're making a mistake. I, I really do think that, that China is you know, trying to take over certain aspects of global trade. In fact, they, the Made in China 2025 initiative essentially says we want to be the only place that produces anything in the world so that we control the flow of goods and therefore the, the flow of money. And they, they've made significant, significant progress. Hey, Hannah, nice to see you. Um, they've made significant progress on that front. And the problem, of course, is as we see that continued evolution and the wealth transfer kind of all going one direction, every country is at risk. And so, you know, to be honest, at some point, if the U.S. makes progress on this, other countries we'll probably try to get um, and make a smackdown with uh, our friends in China as well. So th the whole point is to make it fair. It should be, you know, don't steal my intellectual property is one of the founding principles here. Uh, let's try to have some level of uh, fairness when it comes to the balance of trade instead of one country being plus 500 billion, maybe it's a little more flat in terms of the, the back and forth. And this is what can sustain trade. That's, that's some of the big point issues. All right, so we've already talked about who pays the tariffs, how do you know if your tariff is applied, and then what are some of the things you can do about the tariffs. The, the advanced things you can do about the tariffs is start sourcing elsewhere. Um, I, I know a lot of people, uh, thanks Hannah, uh, always nice to hear you, uh, and, and she points out that you know I'm taking a level-headed view of the tariffs and, and looking at the long game. This is a long game for me. I've been importing from China um, you know, full containers and stuff directly since around 2001, 2002, probably. Uh, I went to China in 2002, probably for the first time. So 17 plus years of doing this. And I bought, just for, I don't know, credibility sake, I've, my team has overseen and my companies have uh, procured hundreds of millions of dollars of products uh, from international trade, most of it coming from China. And so I get it. I understand what's happening. And we have significant efforts to try to mitigate our own risk. So what I'm sharing with you is not, you know, some guy who has some crazy opinions. These are things we're doing ourselves. So I was just leading into this idea of what if this is a long-term situation? Because, again, I, I have um, uh, sellers, they tell me, well, you know, I'll raise my price a little and I'll suck up some of the pain. And, you know, China still you know, 50 or 60% cheaper than uh, other countries. Uh, first of all, I challenge that, that premise. It's true sometimes, but not every time. And secondly, if you're good at sourcing, there's no reason you can't source certain products. Uh, there are some categories that are harder. Consumer electronics is the hardest. But other things, especially handmade things, can be sourced from all over Asia. In fact, South America is in play. And uh, even sometimes Eastern Europe is in play. So this idea that China is the only source for everything is actually a good marketing ploy by China. There are lots of ways you can find uh, these other resources. And we have already, you know, multiple factories working in Vietnam, things uh, being transferred to Cambodia, Malaysia, and uh, India as well. And I think there's going to be a lot of activity around that kind of movement. Now, let's not kid ourselves. China has a huge advantage because of their infrastructure and kind of their experience. And and just basically the, the full supply chain has been built around China. And I'm talking about raw materials, transportation, um, you know, all kinds of things like that. Uh, Kimberly says she would like to learn more about sourcing elsewhere. 
Uh, you're not alone, Kimberly. Um, I actually am doing a um, like a pioneer trip. Um, we already sourced from uh, three or four factories in Vietnam. We switched some of that production from China to Vietnam. I'm going uh, to Vietnam for two weeks in uh, July next month, and I can tell you that we were we're looking at um, trying to host you know, uh, a, a sourcing trip or at least find a, a trip that we can recommend to people on the Empowery co-op side of things for Vietnam, India, and uh, South America as well. We have some already that we can refer people to. So if you are interested in kind of learning about those other things, make sure you're staying in touch with the Empowery e-commerce cooperative because when I solve this problem for myself, the first thing I do is I try to share those resources with the co-op so that all the co-op members and the shareholders there get the, the first access to it. And, uh, and I really want you guys to know that this is absolutely solvable. You know, there are, there are you know, sleeping bags or backpacks or tents, um, suddenly in the outdoor category, let's go into the bedrooms, lamps and desks and sheets and, you know, uh, you know wall hangings, plumbing supplies. I can find those almost anywhere. And it probably doesn't take, you know, my sourcing team very much time at all to find potential candidates, but it takes us all long time to suss out the quality of those candidates. You know, so let's say you find five or 10 candidates in a, in a country. Now you have to, you know, get samples and kind of go through the same routine that you would in China or anywhere else to validate quality and, you know, how customer service friendly are they? Are they really capable of handling your volume or your scale? Um, how do you diversify the risk? Um, and Kimberly, yeah, bamboo items, uh, depending on what they are. So I, just so you know, Kimberly, I'm a, I would say a bamboo export. In the early 2000s, I was the largest importer of bamboo um, in the United States. And I still own a brand called iBamboo, although it's not active at the moment, iBamboo.com. Um, it depends on the types of bamboo items, but there are you know, whether it's bamboo textiles or bamboo solid wood um, that's made into everything from floors to wall panels to uh, kitchen supplies or bathroom supplies or veneers, there are uh, definitely wherever bamboo is grown, including India, Vietnam, maybe Cambodia, certainly obviously in China, um, you can find various suppliers of different things. So there's all kinds of ways to make that category work, but Again, I want to just acknowledge that China has certain advantages that kind of the, the reigning champion will always have. They're the incumbent. They have the advantage. But so there's th this is the reality we live in today. We can say we want to source elsewhere and take a proactive measure to, to move outside of China. And in two months or 12 months, it could all be a head fake and it all kind of is resolved and all the, the uh, tariffs go away, and then all that work and all that energy may be a sunk cost that it turns out that China's still a better choice a year from now. But there's also the opposite possibility, that this thing gets way worse, and, and that it, in fact, um, escalates. And to be, I, I said it uh, earlier in this episode, but I've also admitted this on other podcast episodes, I thought this was going to resolve itself earlier. I didn't expect this to continue on this long, and certainly not with the ratcheting up of the rhetoric. And in the last, you know, let's say 15 to 30 days, it's gotten worse. And some of the things that we are watching indicate it's going to still get even worse. Uh, the fact that the Chinese, there are certain importers in China, they are now uh, storing the soybeans they get from America. That means they're hunkering down for a long war. There's other economic indicators, um, including President Xi, the Chinese, uh, uh, I don't know if he's a president, or premier, or prime minister, I don't know what he is. But anyway, the, the king of China, essentially, the uh, lifetime leader of China, uh, I think it's President Xi, now that I think about it, he has said, we're willing to come back to the table. And Trump has said, no, we're not willing to come back to the table. We already had a deal, you reneged, and uh, now we're gonna, we're gonna make you wait. There are, political realities that we have to deal with. These protests in Hong Kong do not help us. They do not help us uh, solve this problem. And Carlo, I, I hear you. They, it may seem like they're strong enough to challenge us, but they are not, uh, in my humble opinion. They, the, the panic through this China supply chain as we start changing stuff, I mean, 
my factories, they don't call and say, we'll take on this 15% hit because they don't care or they feel strong. They're panicked about it. Um, and <laughs> Rogers, uh, you know, misery loves company. So Roger has pointed out that, you know, you think uh, tariffs have dragged on a bit. You should uh, hang out with Brexit for, Brexit for a few years. Uh, and I, I was just in London a couple weeks ago. And, uh, Kimberly, I saw your note. I'm sorry I missed you in Austin or sorry we didn't get to spend more time. But when I was in London, uh, just a few days after Austin, uh, there is some joke about Brexit that uh, is something like, you know, what does Brexit mean? It means uh, you say you're out of here, but never actually leave. So uh, I, I suppose uh, without getting too digressed here, my point is there are many, many factors at play here. And it doesn't matter if China is going to win or the U.S. is going to win. As b small business people, we got to figure out how to adapt, right? We can't cry and, you know, writing a note to the senator or the president. None of that's going to matter. We have to figure out how to adapt. And what are you going to do to make sure that your business continues on? Because the politicians certainly don't care. And I think everybody who has, uh, you know, an ongoing business who wants that business to be worth something when they sell it or, um, you know, have some sort of equity exit at some point, this is a big danger to you. So we, we, we covered kind of all the basics. I definitely think long term you should be talking about what other possible places are there, um, you know, to source from. In other words, every single one of you has an HTC code. Sometimes they're called HTS codes, but that's the harmonized tariff code that you use to import. And this is a globally recognized code, right? So these are, I don't know, six, eight nine digit codes. I don't remember the numbers. I don't clear my own customs. <laughs> my team does that. And I, I, Sherry, who leads that team, she tells me that we're still, we're still clearing between 25 and 35 containers a week. And we just got whacked with a bunch of those tariffs. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm telling you firsthand that this stuff is hurting us. Um, we're not thrilled about it, but we're also, we don't have the luxury of just crying about it and commiserating how this is going to ruin the economy or any of this other nonsense. Um, it's part of life, and I've seen these cycles come and go many, many times. So I, you know, am I in love with the idea that we have to deal with this? No. But I know that we have no choice, and we will deal with it. That's just, that's our job. And uh, as I like to say, if it was easy, anybody could do it. So it, it's up to us to figure it out. So... Let me recap some of the things you can do to deal with tariffs right now. Hey, boy, I got both Dana and Adam online. Good to see you guys. Um, one of the things you can do is you, if you have reasonable volume, you talk to your supplier and say, hey, these tariffs are really creating a big uh, burden for us. You know, can you take on some of, this, some of this hit? And initially they might tell you no, but if you're not in China, you can't do it in person, then at least get on a video call and tell them, hey, we would like to order more stuff from you but this is a big problem. Um, Henson's asking me a question. Uh, so Henson says, do you think most sellers will tack on the cost to the consumer? So that's a, that really is the million dollar question, Henson. Very good, very good point. So here's a, a few, um, I don't know, uh, punches in the face of reality. <laughs> so buckle up everybody. <laughs> um, first of all, I don't think the average seller knows their landed costs. So, uh, my apologies if you do, but I think most sellers don't actually even know their landing costs. So let's start with the knowing your numbers and the basic economics matter. Number two, uh, this is only on the, the cost of your product. This is not on the retail. So the question is how much would you add, if anything, uh, to the cost of the consumer? And I think most sellers have such low margins and they're also so scared to raise the cost because they're afraid of the Amazon flywheel effect. So, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong here, but give me the thumbs up and the love if you, if you agree with me. Everybody, when they see these tariffs, are like, I'm just gonna try to suck it up and deal with it because I'm afraid to raise the price because if I raise the price, Amazon, I might lose the buy box or I might lose my ranking. And then that flywheel is kind of goes down, down, down. And then Amazon punishes me because um, you know, I've raised my price and it, it's, it's a vicious cycle. So the answer Henson is, I think the most sophisticated people will absolutely do everything they can to mitigate the increase, manage the currency deal, you know, try to minimize that, that whatever the net increase really is. And then the, the smartest people who actually have profit margins 
will in fact add on cost to the consumer over time. The, the people who are most at risk, and I want you guys to listen up and pay close attention. If you sell at razor thin margins and you don't know your numbers, particularly landed costs, you are the most vulnerable. You are the one that will get wiped out because you don't even know the math. And listen, I hate doing math. Um, but the idea that we run a business without doing math is definitely not uh, an acceptable outcome. And so get help if you don't know how to do it. Uh, Freddie says, in my category, no one raised the price. I thought it was going to create inflation, uh, but I was mistaken. And I can tell you, Freddie, right now, people, they're not reacting very quickly. Some people have old inventory. Uh, Kimberly points out she, she lost the buy box on her own listing due to raising the price. Uh, my advice, Kimberly, on that is to raise it much smaller increments and do it over, you know, you know, a dollar or two over, you know, every other day for two or three weeks until you get it where you want to go. Um, but the, the reality is, I think everybody who is hesitant to raise price has good reasons for that hesitancy. But at the end of the day, margin is the only thing you can spend. And th there's an old saying in, in retail, something like, uh, Revenue is for vanity and profit is for sanity. And right, so everybody likes to go, hey, well, you know, what's my turnover? Or, you know, I'm doing, you know, 10,000 a month or 100,000 a month or a million a month or whatever it is. And everybody's like, oh, wow, that's really impressive. You know, I can tell you, I, I had uh, a $1.8 million day on my first attempt to do a million dollar day. Not just me, of course, it was a big company. And, but that doesn't mean we made a ton of money that day. Uh, I don't remember the profit, but it was not, uh, you know, it was not enough to retire on, I can tell you that. Uh, there's Nicole and Chris over there in uh, jolly old England. Nice to see you guys. So, again, my point on this is, you know, at some point you're going to have to raise the price. You're going to have to figure out how to differentiate, as always. That's a, a prerequisite to really being successful in this business. And without that differentiation, without being able to have a brand that you can control, it's going to be harder. And by the way, part of, the, part of this outcome might be that you sell on additional channels too because Amazon is relentless in beating us down on our own brand. They decide some uh, generic brand that is you know, selling via, um, what is that? Uh, I forget the name of the, the China, the e-packets. So some brand is selling a, you know, a, a product via e-packets that takes four weeks to get to you and they're, they're charging nine bucks, you're charging, you know, $12 and suddenly you lose the buy box because Amazon's computer says you're not competitive. This is not an ideal situation. And by the way, this is something the FTC is investigating Amazon when it comes to monopoly and price fixing as well. So I, I know I'm, I'm kind of covering a lot of ground here, but the reality is this is a very complex issue. And I'm going to just come back and summarize it, and I'm going to jump offline. So if you guys have questions, get them in now before I go. The first is, um, you know, on the who, who pays tariffs. The importer of record pays tariffs. Uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have to be the only one sharing, you know, holding the burden. You can share the burden with your, with your supplier if you have enough volume to get uh, leverage. If it's a, your first time placing an order, or you do small volumes, it's harder for you to get the leverage that I'm talking about. And by the way, when we're having conversations with suppliers, we talk about four topics. Um, and I, I won't go into those in depth, but I'll, I'll just, um, in fact, Monday, I think Melissa at the Empowery Co-op is setting up a, a free webinar for folks where I'm gonna go into a little bit more depth. But here's the four topics that we talk about to suppliers right now. One, what is the amount of the tariff that you're going to take? Two, what's the situation with the currency? Um, in other words, did we peg it in U.S. dollars? Is it, is it uh, on the RMB? We want to make sure that the currency is fluid and moving to our favor, and not unfairly to our favor. If the currency goes the other direction, then it's fair that we adjust. But I don't want them to win. Uh, I, I talked to probably a dozen sellers at the end of last year uh, Hannah, just go to empowery.org and you can get in the mailing list. And empowery.com is the marketing side of that. This is an e commerce cooperative. It's basically it's where I dump all of my favorite resources in my Rolodex to try to help people. It's a nonprofit member owned co op 
uh, definitely check that out. It's really important for people to get involved so that we have leverage and we have influence and buying power and blah, blah, blah. So thanks for the question. So I come back to the, the four questions I'm asking Chinese suppliers right now. One, what, if any amount, will they do on tariffs? Two, what are they doing about currency? Where, what's our position from the time they gave me a price quote to the time we're paying? Uh, three, by the way, uh, well, I'll, I'll come back to this one. Three is um, what are my terms, right? When we set up with a, a vendor that we think we're going to do at least a million dollars a year with, we will not accept anything less than net 60 days after it ships. That means 0% down, and we don't pay nothing until 60 days after it ships. And I know people that are like, oh, that's impossible. And my supplier said, no, China doesn't work like that. I don't really care what people say because we've done hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from China, and I know how it works. Uh, you, you think Walmart shows up and, and wires money ahead of time? Uh, they don't. Anyway, I'm getting on a little bit of a rant. Thanks, <laughs> uh, Hannah, for those uh, wows. Anyway. Um, so we talk about terms. What, what's the relevant terms that needs to be done? Uh, Roger says that's hardcore. Frankly, uh, Roger, uh, I'll come back to terms here in a minute if you remind me and tell you some terms that will blow your mind. Uh, those are just kind of normal terms to start with. Um, the, the fourth piece of that equation is product liability insurance. And we have a very specialized way of getting product liability insurance provided by the manufacturer. In some cases, we'll share the cost and we have a system for how we do that over time. But that's how we're able to uh, pay a lot less money uh, for product liability insurance and get the best coverage possible that is globally applicable. And so these four items, everybody says, oh, it's impossible. It doesn't work. Nobody knows how to do it. Uh, and we had a, a chap who came to the Empower e-commerce uh, summit in Seattle a couple of weeks ago. And he's a brilliant guy. And we said, you know, he's talking about his volume. He's like, I just I can't get him to give me terms. And within seven days, my, turn, my team got him a $200,000 line of credit uh, for 30 days from his Chinese supplier. So that's just an example of, yes, it does happen. You kind of need to know how the system works a little bit, but anybody can do it if you have volume. I want to just, I've said this 10 times in this conversation. If you don't have volume, right, if you don't have enough volume to make a, a supplier really interested and excited about it, then they have no incentive to give you better terms, right? Somebody who says, you know, I'm, I'm ordering 500 units of this and they won't give me 90 day terms. They shouldn't give you terms because the, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Doing paperwork for small amounts of money doesn't behoove anybody, even yourself. And, uh, and I can tell you that getting supplier credit is easier right now than even normal because suppliers don't want to lose your business. Giving you credit you know, even if your costs go up by 10%, let's say due to the tariffs or 15% due to the, the recent increase on the, the Section 310 stuff, you know, what if you could get 60 day terms on that money from your supplier? You know, how would that change the equation of cash flow? That's part of this, this big picture supply chain management that I, that I like to talk about. So, anyway, those are the four topics. Um, I think it was uh, somebody asked about, you know, hardcore terms. Let me see if I can go by. Oh, Roger. Yeah, and so here's some terms we've been offered in the recent days, um, uh, let's say in the last 60 days. So once you're kind of known to be a reasonable volume buyer, um, suppliers will bend over backwards trying to earn your business. And we've had this happen for the last 15 years at various times with different suppliers, where basically a supplier, a factory will show up and say, hey, we want to sell to you. And we're like, eh, we're fine. We don't need your help. Um, we're already covered. And they'll be like, well, we'll give you great terms. We'll give you great pricing, right? It's like, we got terms, we got pricing, we got, we got everything already. What could you possibly give us? And then they, this is the ultimate uh, thing that gets our attention. They go, well, what if we put inventory in a U.S. warehouse that's consigned to you, and as you sell it, you pay us. And if you can't sell it, we'll just take it back. And that's called like consigned inventory where we have no liability, we have, don't have to pay for it until it sells. And by the way, we pay for it 30 days after it sells. So that's the ultimate in uh, terms. And then uh, <laughs> believe it or not, it happens more than you'd think. Again, this is not factories that are tiny. This is not, you know, $5,000, $10,000 deals. These are multi-million dollar deals. But, uh, you know, when people see the net 60, and they're like, wow, that's hardcore. That's going to be hard to get. Just know there's a, a level so far above that which is consignment inventory, where the factory actually says, 
we'll either ship you the stuff and you keep it in your warehouse or we'll make a warehouse in the US or use a 3PL. And you sell that, you know, as you place POs, um, you pay us at, on those POs. And uh, no, this is all private label stuff, Diago. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. We don't do any branded stuff. Uh, we make our own brands and we do that and have done that since around 2002, 2003 is when we, we really got into the, the our building our own brands. I know people call it private label, but uh, I really want you guys to think of it as brand building, not just sticking your sticker on somebody else's crap. You know, make it good, make it interesting, and make the brand mean something. So uh, last shot for asking questions, guys. I, I didn't actually intend to go on this long, but I appreciate you all watching and giving me all the little hearts and the, all those little things. There's some uh, psychological dopamine that release that uh, the scientists say that fills the soul with goodness when you see those things. So thank you for that. Uh, bear in mind, everybody, again, I think – uh, we're going to do a um, webinar, free webinar, on Monday and go into some of these things in more detail. And on Monday, we're going to disclose the top ways that people are cheating the tariff system. Uh, and I'll, I'm not telling you these so that you go cheat. I'm telling you uh, about these cheats so that you can look out for them and you can be wary of them. Um, and, and that's a really, really uh, important thing. So Thiago asked a follow-up question. What if we don't sell all the consigned units? Uh, will the factory have ownership of your branded goods? So it's a fair question, Diago. So uh, there's two things. One is um, in some cases we will use, so if it's absolutely our brand boxes, if it's like our brand everything, then we will have kind of a, what we call a liquidation uh, deal. So if we don't sell them, let's say over the course of six months, then they mark it down and we buy it um, at the markdown rates because clearly the, the product didn't sell. Um, on the other hand, if we use what's called white label goods, so this is still a very nice package. It's very cool. It, it looks great, but it doesn't have a particular brand name on it. This is called a white label idea. Um, then we will just let the factory kind of take that back and deal with it on their own uh, without it conflicting with what we're doing in our sales channels. Uh, and I know that you guys, you know, mostly sell on Amazon are just concerned that the supplier will jump on Amazon and steal the listing and steal the price and sell lower costs and all that. And that's a fair consideration. Um, you can block that stuff through contracts. And this is a whole different episode. But yes, you can enforce contracts in China. Yes, your POs can even have um, meaning in China, enforceability. Um, and there's a, an arbitration method in China that you can do if you follow the right procedure. So maybe I'll cover that in Monday's uh, free webinar also. So anyway, um, you know, I love entrepreneurs. I hope you guys, uh, your business is good. Don't be panicked. Uh, let's see, Gracie's asking a question here, hang on. Uh, yeah, so it sounds like she was offered uh, some sort of backup inventory. That they want to ship a container, store in a warehouse, and she didn't take that just yet, but she may consider it. I think as, you, as your volume is there, there's all kinds of ways to work with these different uh, suppliers. And by the way, this is global. When you do enough volume, we often tell the supplier, hey, you need to keep three months worth of raw materials there. You're, you're welcome, Thiago, Hannah. You know, keep those materials on hand so that when we place an order, it doesn't take three months. It only takes 30 days. And that's the first kind of ratchet move you can get. The next one is, hey, we're ordering this, you know, maybe ordering one or two containers a month. Keep an extra container of back stock. You go ahead and pre-make it. Don't ship it yet. And when we're ready to buy it, we'll buy it. And then you just move through that over time. So lots and lots of ways to deal with this stuff. And again, these are global um, concepts. This doesn't just apply to China. This applies to anywhere in the world. And I've, I've sourced, I haven't counted all the countries, but from Africa, Eastern Europe, um, uh, South America, Central America, all through Asia, U.S., Canada, um, you know, dozens of countries for sure. And it's, it's all the same at the end of the day. You find somebody you trust, you make a deal, you sustain the, the relationship, and you carry on with your life. So uh, anyway, guys, uh, I appreciate you all. Have a great day. Um, don't forget to um, – I don't know where we're going to publicize, but Melissa Simonson will, will be publicizing the, the webinar for Monday if, if it's a go. And I'm going to dive in a little bit more detail on these items, including, again, telling you what to do and also what not to do. I'm going to tell you the ways that uh, people are cheating the system. And, uh, and that will be Monday.
we'll see everybody later. Thanks uh, for everyone uh, for your support and uh, good luck. Uh, have a great Prime Day. Bye, everybody.